Welcome to Ann Arbor Democracy, a place for conversation about how our local leaders are elected and how political decisions are made, what this looked like in the past, and what it looks like now. This project aims to explore the recent history and current reality of Ann Arbor Democracy. For a brief period of time in the early 1970s, Ann Arbor's elected city government included three political parties, Democrats, Republicans, and a third party, the Human Rights Party, or HRP. The HRP opposed the Vietnam War and other U.S. military interventions while supporting labor unions and advocating for truly progressive local policies around racial and sexual equality, drug law reform, tenants' rights, and social services. Transparency, inclusion, and community control were core principles of the Human Rights Party. In 1972, two members of the Human Rights Party won elections to Ann Arbor City Council, Jerry DeGreek from Ward 1 and Nancy Wexler from Ward 2. Both Jerry and Nancy were students at the University of Michigan, and their wards included many university students. At that time, decisive elections for City Council occurred in April. Last year, I reached out to Jerry DeGreek and asked him about his experience serving on Ann Arbor City Council from 1972 to 1974. Jerry has lived in Seattle for over 40 years, but when he was in the area to see family, he passed through Ann Arbor in order to meet with me. What follows is a conversation we recorded in September 2022. In part one, we talk about what motivated Jerry to become an activist and how he got engaged with our local Ann Arbor politics. He describes how the HRP and other groups worked together in advocating for progressive policy that was not yet embraced by the two major parties. All right, so you can just state your name. Sure. My name is uh, Jerry DeGreek. And I'm talking to you because you ran for and ran and won a seat on city council in 1972. And that is correct. On the Human Rights Party, no less. Yes. And I, I was so excited when you reached out to me after I sent you a letter. I didn't, I, this was a wonderful, wonderful surprise. And I've been frantically researching the last week since I found out you were going to be in town. So you first ran for city council in 1971 as a write-in candidate. That's correct. For yes. the Radical Independent Party, That's right. right. RIP. So, RIP. <laughs> so I'm interested in understanding what it looked like in that era for you, a young person, to get engaged in our local politics and what was driving you, what were the issues. So talk to me a little bit about that. Wow, that's a that is a great question. Um, I was I have been uh, political all my life. Um, well, ever since I was about ten years old, uh, I grew up in a suburb of Detroit, Michigan, uh, and um, to a working class family. But the neighborhood I lived in was very middle and upper class, uh, and my my father was, was a plumber, um, and um, I at a very early age, realized that I was uh, different um, because of my, because I was uh, gay. I didn't even know what the word meant in those days. Uh, But the way that I kind of dealt with my being gay, uh, since I, there was no way, this is in the 1950s and early 60s, there was no way to express that or acknowledge that was to be very political. So from an early age, I was interested in politics. In 1960, when I was 10, I campaigned for John Kennedy. And I then became very interested in the civil rights movement and the grape and lettuce boycott movements uh, when I was in, in high school. And that was kind of my way to express how I was different without ever um, being gay or acknowledging that, uh, because there was no way that I could do that, but I certainly could. Um, be political and uh, and support other uh, political movements, which were very contrary to uh, to my family and to many people in the in, in the community that I that I grew up in. But as I um, <clears throat> you know got older in in uh, high school, I knew that I wanted to leave my all white suburb. As a matter of fact, the neighborhoods that I lived in in outside Detroit had covenants that would not allow uh, black people to live in the, um, the, the city which I grew up in. Uh, and, um, 
So I realized I really wanted to change and get away from my family. And no one in my family had gone away to college, but I was determined that I, you know, I needed to, to get away. I didn't for a moment think I could go out of state or anything like that. So um, Ann Arbor and the University of uh, Michigan was 50 miles away from my home, but to me it was like a lifetime away. So I, you know, I um, worked to be able to to go to college uh, at the University of Michigan, and there I found a completely different environment from what I had grew up in in terms of the diversity of the student population and the population in Ann Arbor, as well as a, an extremely active and vibrant uh, political community that I became very active in uh, when I went to Ann Arbor, first in, in um, student uh, politics in terms of, um, of, of all of the different causes, the anti-war movement, uh, establishing a student uh, bookstore, um, uh, tenants' rights, and so on and, and so forth. Um, I ran for uh, student council uh, at the University of uh, Michigan and was elected and then later ran uh, for vice president of the student body as a radical and, and was elected to that, that position too. So that uh, gave me the opportunity uh, to, um, uh, to be engaged in a variety of political issues at the university and more, more broadly uh, in Ann Arbor and got exposed to uh, to very, you know, um, other people who were far more educated and learned than I was about various um, uh, 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 political tendencies, including socialist tendencies, uh, and uh, and um, uh, learned uh, from them and became active, uh, more uh, more active and more. Uh, radical, shall we say, as the uh, as the years went uh, by, and um, so when I can't remember exactly the origins of, of when we uh, we started the Radical Independence Party, I think around 1970, um, there we wanted to engage in electoral politics because that was where most people were at in terms of their. Um, how they viewed politics, and in order to educate people and to engage with 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 uh, people, we we knew that we had to uh, to be active in electoral in electoral politics. We didn't believe at the time that the Democratic Party was a vehicle for uh, for the kind of politics that we wanted to see happen, because we wanted to see fundamental uh, change. Um, and so, and you know that it should not be about the personality. It should not be about the individual candidate, but it should be about the politics and the policies that, uh, that we were trying to achieve. That's why we had a, a pretty detailed uh, platform uh, from the beginning, I think both for the Radical Independent Party and later when we merged with the Human Rights Party. So we... Um, um, we um, developed a detailed platform that we ran on and, and you know, explicitly said what we would do if we were elected uh, to the city council. We, we realized we were not going to be able to implement or, or, or enact everything, but, but part of the reason for engaging in electoral politics was to engage with people, to educate people, uh, and not simply to um, to win and enact policy, though we certainly wanted to uh, to do the latter as, as uh, well. So, um, y you know, it just was a natural progression, in, and I had been engaged in many different political movements, uh, particularly the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement, uh, and later anti-racism work. I, I should also say that both the Radical Independent Party and the Human Rights Party, from a very early, from the beginning, had a, a view that it was important that we engage with lots of different movements and, and uh, people. It, it wasn't just about students having power. It wasn't solely about black power or the civil rights movement. It wasn't just about the anti-war movement, but all of these things were, uh, were uh, connected. Um, so I think I'll pause there. Is that <laughs> well, okay? That's wonderful. Okay. I mean, I do want to say that I, I, I've been really impressed at the, the archives that I'm reading from the library 
about how specific your platform was. And so it really resonates. It is it is a completely legitimate claim that you make about focusing on policy and not the personalities and the people, um, because it is notable that you are a, you are a historic figure in so far as your identity, but it was the policy that your party was putting forward that you that was thought through and you, you were really strong advocates for the positions that you were putting out. Right, right. Even though, by the way, that I um, knew that I was gay from a very early age, I never acted on it and I didn't come out until while I was on city council. I was trying to understand how these elections actually happened. So in the 70s, the elections for council happened in April. That's um, right. And somebody told me a few days ago that we didn't have the the parties were in control of choosing their candidates in a way that is not quite the way it works now. So what did it look how how did you how did the party function in choosing you and Nancy Waxler and um Jeannie Plamondon and I have I have names written down that I just kind of Nancy Romer Burkhart was yep. was our fifth ward candidate, I remember. Um and I think David Black was um in the uh uh, fourth, third ward. fourth ward. Okay, yep. great. Yeah, it was um, it, it it was done by the uh, party membership uh, people who came to our meetings, and anyone could really come to our meetings and then vote. Um, but I think you know it wasn't like <laughs> we had multitudes of people wanting to run, right? Because mm -hmm. it was a big deal to run a campaign and then to serve. Uh, for two years, and, and 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 we were hoping that we could elect at least one um, one city council member. This is speaking more about seventy two, but even in terms of of uh, seventy one, I think uh, we ran a candidate for mayor, if I recall, as a write-in candidate, and we ran uh, um, I ran in the second ward in uh, in nineteen seventy one as a write-in candidate, um, but. Um, I guess it was who was willing to run, and the party kind of coalesced around uh, those those folks. And fool that I be, I was willing, and so I ran in uh, in um, in uh, 1971. Likewise, in 1972, we wanted when we after we had merged with the Human Rights Party statewide, which was strategic for us because uh, in order to get on the ballot, we really needed to be. Uh, connected to a statewide party organization in order to get the signatures uh, to be able to uh, to appear on the on the Ann Arbor uh, ballot, and we knew that we, you know, to be viable at all, we really needed to be on the ballot and not just run write-in candidates. So we wanted to have a full slate of uh, candidates. We wanted to have a diversity of of candidates. We did not want uh, men to be uh, dominant in that. One of the reasons why we ran Nancy Wexler in the second ward is we felt that we, uh, this is in 1972, um, that we had our best chance of electing someone from the second ward. And so we wanted to make sure that our candidate was a, a woman. And Nancy stepped up and was willing to uh, run. And um, and so she was our second ward, ward candidate. Probably the ward we had the next um, uh, largest chance of electing someone was the first ward where there was a, a sizable number of students. It was not a majority student ward. There were more working class and, uh, and low income folks uh, in the first ward. And I was willing again to, to, to step up and run. I think part of the, part of my personal motivation was I didn't think I did as good a job as I should have or could have back in 19, um, 71 as a writing candidate, and I wanted to do a better job. Um, so this gave me an opportunity uh, to, I think, be a better candidate and uh, really uh, reach voters in a way that I had not in, in uh, 1971. Um, so, but it was basically the party membership um, had to agree on the slate of candidates in, uh, in 1972. But again, it wasn't like we had... Um, um, lots, a super amount of interest in many, many candidates. There were different tendencies, though, of course, within the Human Rights Party and the Radical Independent Party um, that later kind of there were caucuses within the uh, uh, party that were somewhat informal. Um, we had some of the more um, hardcore 
um, leftists, uh, kind of old left who had come from old left families maybe, but who had much more of a, of a um, um, economic um, outlook in terms of, uh, or, or, pers- or per- per- socialist perspective in, in terms of um, uh, their, uh, their views, which I agreed with to a great deal, um, but I was not part of that, that tendency. Uh, we had another caucus that we call the militant middle, and I was part of the, the uh, militant middle, so so we did have have different tendencies with uh, within the party. So the our slate in 1972 kind of reflected that. We had candidates who were much more from the uh, old left tradition, and and uh, and some some who were not uh, as well. Well, and I was reading also that the um, the Rainbow People's Party was quite a bit more radical than. The, am, I, am I stating this accurately? Like I'm reading reports of it. Um, well, I don't think they were. They were certainly not more. I mean, they were. They were a major tendency and group within the Human Rights Party in 1972 when we ran. Um, but I certainly would not characterize them as being more more radical than the rest of the party. Okay. I would, um, they were very, very much um, uh, tied into the marijuana. Uh, work that that the party did in terms of wanting to decriminalize drugs and that kind of thing. That was their that was a major focus for them. Not their sole focus, but um, but certainly a a, a major uh, focus of the Rainbow People's Party. But they were also very I, I, I think interested as as were the rest of the party about you know um, um, the rights of and and how black people in this uh, country and state and community were being, you know, um, uh, harmed. And, uh, and, 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 and that was a major issue as well, racism. Um, but, uh, so, so they were a tendency within HRP. So we had the, uh, chocolate almond caucus, which was the more, uh, radical, um, old left, uh, group. We had the militant middle, which, um, it was ill-defined. And I, you know, in, in many ways embraced and sided with the, uh, political views of the Chocolate Almond Caucus, but I think I was more um, pragmatic is probably not the right word, but I can't think of another one at the moment. Uh, and then we had the uh, Rainbow People's Party. But it wasn't like we were at odds because there was a lot of, uh, you know, cross interest in terms of the issues that, uh, you know, that uh, that we all had. Um, but, but there were different viewpoints within the party is what I'm trying to say. There was an actual split between the HRP and the Rainbow People's Party. Yeah, that the Rainbow People's Party was more interested in uh, coalition building with, you know, liberal Democrats. As a matter of fact, they did not endorse our um, radical independent party candidates in 1971, in part because they didn't think we we, we could win. But... Um, um, but the rest of the party, even though we would make strategic alliances with the Democrats and sometimes the Republicans when we were on the council too, to get something through, uh, we, we actually had, I think, even more of a viewpoint that the two-party system was, um, could not bring about the kind of fundamental radical change that we thought was needed in this country, even more so than the Rainbow People's Party. That's my memory anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I um so there's a there's a key point of history that we've both overlooked which is that um there was a big change in terms of who was eligible to eligible to vote oh, yes. between eight to 18 so we're from 21 down to 18 and and when I when I think about what kind of involvement that I see currently on campus I mean we're 50 50 years away from that change and i'm surely it was that much more exciting to be newly eligible to vote um absolutely that that was a um major change that allowed 18 year olds to vote and then even beyond that i believe it was the michigan supreme court uh stated that students would be able to vote in where they went to school because that's where they lived primarily that basically they would have to that uh localities could not have restrictions on students voting that they didn't have for any other group of people. And so students previously had not been allowed to a large extent, even if they were the um, old enough, 
uh, to to vote in the town where they uh, went to school. So that changed in 1971, I believe, so that uh, we were able to to um, uh, to you to to have the student, students be a major constituency, particularly in the second ward, but also in the first ward and throughout the uh, city, really, um, as a political force uh, for, for you know good radical politics. And uh, so we did want to tap into that very much. And that was a huge change. In part two, Jerry talks about how the HRP ran grassroots campaigns, promoting inclusive conversations and community control. He explains how his work on an anti-discrimination ordinance prompted him to publicly come out along with his HRP colleague, Nancy Wexler. Like and subscribe if you'd like to be alerted to more content like this.